better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all your progress and joy in the faith so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through, may, through my coming to you again. Thank you, Spencer. You know, Paul, the apostle, he is, uh, he is between two worlds. He's struggling um, and he's wrestling. He's, he's in a dilemma. And we see that in, as he writes uh, to, back to the church at Philippi, he's in, he's in prison. And we know he's in a Roman prison. He's chained to these guards, these Roman guards. And with all of this going on, he is struggling because Paul, like, like us, is, has this dilemma. He wants to go to heaven. He knows that heaven is going to be such an incredible place. It's going to be so much better. At the same time, he knows that if he stays, good things are happening, good things in ministry. I love what the Apostle Paul has already said here in in Philippians chapter 1. He said that there's the furtherance of the gospel. The gospel has been furthered even while he has been shackled, even while he is in prison. Good things are going on. God is using him and wonderful things are happening. But Paul doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He is in, in, in this Roman prison. He is writing back to the church at Philippi. He doesn't know if he's going to die. He doesn't know if he's going to be released. He has no idea, and he is, he is struggling. I believe that Paul, what he knew about heaven, made him think differently about, about earth. He uh, knows that we, while you're living on earth, you ought to be longing for heaven. In fact, that's what Jesus said in John chapter 6. He said that we ought to not be working for the food uh, of earthly food, but we ought to be working for the food that endures to eternal life. That while we live on earth, this certainly is uh, a place that we have to stay. Um, we ought to be longing for heaven. So how do we balance that? I hear a lot of people say, "Man, I just you know I just want Jesus to return. I just you know I just want it all to end." Somewhat, even some kind of a fatalistic kind of idea. The apostle Paul said, "Listen." When I go to heaven, it's going to be great. But while I'm here, there are certain things that I need to be doing, and I'm going to be useful in serving the Lord. And then he says this great, one of the great verses in all the Bible found here in the book of Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you have that as your purpose, if you have that as your philosophy of life, you cannot go wrong. You frame everything in light of uh, these verses um, you, will, uh, you will have a life that's pleasing um, to God. Columbus uh, died in 1506. Columbus, of course, that great explorer, Christopher Columbus. Um, if you go to Spain, they love Christopher Columbus. Many of you have traveled there, and um, I've never been to Spain. My son went to study abroad there, and, and he brought back several pictures. There's statues and pictures of Col- Christopher Columbus everywhere. But there's an interesting statue of, of Christopher Columbus in Spain, and it's this, it's this particular statue. And I didn't show you the whole statue because it really doesn't matter. I wanted you to see that there are some words on this statue that are being clawed away by uh, this lion. What it said is non plus ultra. What it means is no more worlds. Before Christopher Columbus sailed, they thought there was nothing else to be discovered. There was nothing else to be seen. But now, the lion, because of what Christopher Columbus has done, he is, he is uh, clawing away the idea of non, only so it says there is more beyond. The reason I bring that up is because you and I live in a world like that. We know there's more beyond. We live around people that say, hey, it doesn't get any better than this. We're going to get a paycheck, and we're going we're gonna to live, we're going to live our life, and then we're going to die, and that's it. But we know there is more we, certainly, we know there is more beyond. So this is Paul's dilemma, is, is this balance, and that is that he says, not only for me to live as Christ is to die as gain, he says, if I go on living in the body, it means fruitful labor, yet what shall I choose? I do not know. What I love about this verse is, what he's saying is it hadn't been revealed yet. God hasn't pointed me to the direction. In other words, uh, I don't know how it's going to turn out here in prison. I don't know what's going to happen to me if I get out, if, I, if, I, if I'm saved, it's, it's, I know it's going to be good. But if I die, it's even going to be better. His dilemma is, uh, like John Stott many years ago wrote a book entitled Living Between Two Worlds. 
Um, he, is, he is living literally between two worlds in this prison. He doesn't know if he's going to die and go to heaven, and he doesn't know if he's going to live on in the flesh, but he's trying to balance those two and put in perspective um, the time that he has, uh, that he has left. Um, what, what he's saying is it hadn't been revealed to me. It hasn't been shown to me yet. God is in control. God is sovereign, and whatever he works out is going to be fine with me. So whatever he reveals, um, I'm going to be okay. I love what he says, and I, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself, but he says in verse 23, he says, I'm hard-pressed from both directions. You ever heard somebody say, I'm between a rock and a hard place? But what he's talking about is a traveler who's whose passage gets more narrow, narrower and narrower. Sometimes in life you have fewer choices, you have fewer options. And the, the, in fact, the more options you have, the better you feel, the more joy you have, but the fewer options, the more pressed you feel. It could be the loss of health, it could be aging, it could be a spouse dying, it could be the loss of a job, it could be the loss of a vision, it could be a loss of so many things, but what happens is it gets narrower and narrower, and the more narrow it gets, the more binding you feel, the more pressure you feel on yourself, and that's how Paul felt between a rock and a hard place. His choices are not as great as they used to be. In prison, he was going to have a choice of getting out or dying. Those were his choices. Right now, you are living with a lot of choices. You've got you, you, where you go to lunch, what you're going to do, what you have. Your choices are unbelievable. And it's amazing when you have a lot of options and you have a lot of choices, you don't feel this pressure in your life. But when those choices start being taken away from you, uh, one by one, they are extremely uh, confining. So our choices become critical to uh, the struggle. Uh, Mark Twain, when told about heaven, he scoffed and said, um, you can have heaven, give me Bermuda. It's kind of the idea of, you know, just give me a long kind of sunny weekend or vacation. Um, all, the, all I want is pleasure for myself. What happens is when you feel pressed in, two things normally happen. One is you become fatalistic. Those are the people saying, I just want to die. By the way, some of the great saints in the Bible being chased down, they felt like their options were limited they said, man, I wish I had never been born. You become fatalistic. And another thing, you become materialistic. You say, hey, if, I, if I'm going to live on in the flesh, there's nowhere else to go. I'm just going to spend my money, spend my life on pleasure. It's all going to be about me, Mark Twain. Just give me Bermuda. All I want is a sunny vacation somewhere. And so Paul has this incredible uh, dilemma. Um, he's on earth, um, but he's longing to be in heaven. But the next thing I want you to see in this slide is his desire. What Paul really wants, he says, what I really desire is to depart and be with Christ. So this is what Paul wants. That's his desire. He wants to be with Christ. That's what, he's gonna, that's what he wants to do. So you don't, you don't have to wonder what his desire is. But I like these words. He says, first of all, I'm going to depart. In antiquity, the word depart was used in, in three different ways. One is uh, there was a departure because of a sailor. A sailor would, he pull up his mooring ropes, he'd lift the anchor and he would sail from one place to another. I, I like that. Um, I think it's what the Apostle Paul had in mind. Remember when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when he said to Timothy, he said, the time of my departure is near. He saw his death as a ship setting sail to another shore. By the way, we sing songs about that. I'll fly away. I'll fly away to a home on God's what celestial shore, I'll fly away. We even sing songs picturing that death is a departure and we are sailing toward another place. The soldiers used it, by the way. They used it when they took up their tents and they moved to another location. They would pull up their tents and either march forward or they'd pull up their tents and go home. By the way, I love this. Uh, the Bible talks about our bodies being tents. I like the idea that we're just camping here. That's all earth is, it's a big campground. And you're, you're in a, a tent right now. When I was a child, my, um, my dad and mom would take us camping. It wasn't a fifth wheeler or uh, a, it, it wasn't even a pop-up. I don't know if you remember these tents, uh, basically army canvas giant tents. All six of us would stay in this big, green giant tent. I can still smell that canvas 
um, even now while I, while I talk to you. And we'd go fishing and we'd have a campfire. And some of you, some of you are campers and I, 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 I just can't tell you um, how I long to get back home to something a little more permanent. Um, uh, Kay uh, and I, um, I don't ever recall ever taking our kids camping anywhere. One time, uh, we went to Disney World and we went to uh, uh, the um, Fort Wilderness and that was the, uh, stayed in a beautiful trailer, had running water and it was nicer than most hotels we had ever stayed in. And folks, that was hard because the ice machines were so far away. <laughs> and, uh, but you see what I'm saying, don't you? A tent, what, this picture of a tent is, it's, it's something that had threads and stakes in the ground. It was so temporary. One or two people could stay in it, and when you got time, it was time you know, for uh, you to move on, you'd pull up those tent pegs and you'd move on to another place. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, he said, if this earthly tent is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands in the heavens. I think we are too preoccupied with our tents. Well, how does my tent look today? Do we? Do I look good today? You know, is my tent too fat? Is my tent too small? You know, you know, I'll tell you how preoccupied we are with our tent. Even in death, we're still dressing them up, putting makeup on them. It's true. And we could, we say, well, man, Harold died suddenly, but don't he look good? You know, and because we are so preoccupied with our tent, it's true, isn't it? And, and, and this tent is going to be taken down. It's going to be torn down and we're going to move to another location. But not only is the departure sailing and a tent being uh, pulled up, but it is also a yoke being taken off. Not only did sailors use it and soldiers used it, but farmers used it. At the end of the day, that old mule, that old animal, whatever it was, had a yoke on it. A yoke was, it was to give it direction. And, and, and at the end of the day, the farmer, after that animal had worked so hard, he would lift that yoke off of that animal. Remember, Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus wants to control our life, and at the end of our life, when we die, that yoke will be lifted off of us. There will be no more burdens, no more, uh, no more nothing confining us. What, what a, a beautiful picture. It is a picture of a departure. But I want to tell you that heaven is more than just leaving. Death is an encounter. Not only is it a departure, but it is an, an, an encounter. Um, we desire not only to leave, to depart, but he says to be what? To be with, with Christ. Um, that's what makes death so sweet for a Christian. It's not the departure, it is the arrival. Shelley and Malone are here this morning, and my daughter and, and grandson, and when we fly to Denver, normally to try to get the best out of the day, we get up about 3, 3.30 in the morning, we get to the airport, and we fly to Denver. The departure is not that fun. But sometimes when we get there, and they are waiting on us, or we get to their house, and Malone comes running to us, um, the arrival makes it all, makes it all worthwhile. I, I love some of these pictures here. Um, this couple in their 90s being married for 70 years, a grandfather being reunited with his grandson, a soldier being united with his daughter. There's nothing like an arrival. Uh, Paul, he looked at death as not just a departure, but as a revi uh, uh, an arrival. And when we arrive, we, not only will we see, uh, by the way, loved ones that have gone on before us. I like old Brad Paisley's song, When I Get to Where I'm Going. Not only will we see those that have gone on before us, but folks, the main attraction of heaven is Jesus. We will see him face to face. We will be with him for all eternity. In fact, Jesus was talking to his apostles, that it discouraged disciples in John 14, and he said, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you, and if I come again, I'll receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is the main attraction of heaven. I look forward, yes, to seeing family, and I look forward to seeing friends, but I look forward to seeing uh, Jesus who made it all happen for me. With all of his glory and in my resurrected body, I will see him finally face to face. 
uh, th 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul said, We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul said, you finish it, to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. Yeah, so you, you stuttered. Um, you, you can finish that, can't you? That to be absent from this tent, to be absent from this ship, to be absent from this yoke is to be in the presence of all, Almighty God. It'll be a departure and there will be an encounter. But notice what Paul said, it will be so so much better. Um, a lot of times people ask you, hey, what's heaven going to be like? You know, Monty taught a class on heaven, and we talked about what we're going to look like there. People always ask, Carol, what am I going to look like in heaven? You know what a great answer is? You're going to look better. <laughs> That's what he says. That's what, can you imagine your best day, your best day ever, when you look back on it, your best day will pale in comparison to heaven because it is better. The Apostle Paul actually stacks up words in this, and he says it is very much better. It's bad English. It's awesome theology. In other words, it's going to be so much better than I've ever seen. I can almost see Paul in that stinky prison, in that stinky jail, saying, I will never have to smell not another jail. I will never feel the whip of a Roman uh, soldier on my back. I will never hurt. I will never have heartache in my life. I will never have pain like I, will, I am having now. I know that one day when I get in his presence, all of that will uh, go away. It is so much better. No soul sleep, no intermediate state, no purgatory, that we are not in limbo to be absent from the body is to be in his, in his presence. The Apostle Paul looked forward to it. And then pa Paul's decision, I want to back up one slide, is Paul said, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for all of your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Now this book, Philippians, is about joy. And so far we've been talking about Paul's uh, joy, joy in, the, in, in his circumstances, joy in a crisis, joy even where there are critics concerned. But I want you to notice what Paul's saying here in Philippians chapter 1. Paul's saying, I don't want to stay for my joy, I want to stay for yours. You know you have somebody that loves you, when they put their life on hold for you. You know somebody that loves you is someone that will stop what they're doing and they will come to your side, they'll come to your hospital room, they will come into your presence and they will put their life on hold until they make things better for you. The mark of a spiritual person, and Paul certainly was a great man, but the mark of a spiritual person is not how can I get all the joy I can for myself. The mark of a spiritual person is how can I make joy for you? How can I live my life so that your life will be filled with joy? So I know what's better. It's better to go to heaven. But I also know that staying here and working is going to create such joy for you. In fact, he says two things here. It's going to be not only fruitful, there's going to be progress. The fruit here could be many things. Fruit could be soul winning. Fruits... Uh, um, growing uh, mature uh, uh, Christian spiritually. It could be uh, literally monetary. You, could, you know, uh, he talks about gifts uh, being fruit, you know, that are uh, given to him. It could be a myriad of things, but he's saying that if I stay, I know that I can be fruitful and I can help make you fruitful. And also, I know if I stay, um, that uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be for your, for your progress. Progress in the faith actually is, is what he says uh, here. So one day, one day when you're gone, one day when I'm gone, there will be no progress and no fruitfulness in your life. Now we progress to the best place. Now your job's not done yet. Your job's not done yet. You know how I know that? Because I'm looking at you. If you were in heaven, your job's done. But one day, one day, there won't be an opportunity for you to hand out any gospel tracts. 
One day, there won't be an opportunity for you to give anybody a Bible. One day, there's not going to be an opportunity for you to encourage some young person that is discouraged and downhearted. One day, when you breathe your last breath, all of that progress will stop. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, that some of the things that you've taught will live on, and maybe even some of the things that you've written or done, uh, they might live on, your legacy and those kinds of things. What I'm saying is, if you're going to do it, do it now. If you're going to work, work now. If you're, if you're going to be a part of something, be a part of it now. One day, when you breathe your last breath, it, and you see them face to face, and you hear, well done, good and faithful servant, there won't be any opportunity for you to do anything else. Now, I think heaven's going to be an incredible place. It'll be better uh, than we can even uh, imagine. But uh, guess what? There's going to be perfection in heaven. There's going to be Christians in heaven, people that have been bought with the blood of Jesus. There's not going to be an opportunity for you to invite someone to come to worship with you. What I'm saying is, do it now. You've got life and strength and possibilities and potential. Use it now. That's what Paul's saying. Here's what I want to do. I want to go to heaven. That's what I want to do. It's going to be so much better. But right now, God has decided that I'm going to stay here. And there's going to be a furtherance of the gospel. I'm going to keep preaching and teaching. And if I get out of here, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help your joy. I'm going to help the church. When Paul died, there was no more writing of gospels. There was no more writing of, of books, Philippians and Colossians and Ephesians. All of that ended. There was no more teaching guards. There was no more encouraging the saints that would come to see him. When he died, that died with him. And so you're not dead. And if you're not dead, you're not done. God is using you, and he wants to use you. And somehow we think, maybe even like Mark Twain, that we want someplace in Bermuda. Listen, you can visit there, but you've got to come back. And by the way, even when you're there, you need to be encouraging people. You need to be talking to people. Because you were earth-born, but because you were born again, you are on your way to another place. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul says we have a dual citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where you and I are headed. But right now, our tent is here. We've pitched the tent, and, and we're going to move that tent from place to place, and this earth is it's just a camping ground. And one day when it's over, it'll all be so much, so much better. Real, real joy, in closing, I want to tell you that real joy, real happiness comes from serving and giving your life away. That's what the Apostle Paul finds as he writes to the church at Philippi. Real joy is giving. It is not taking. I'm not saying there's not joy in receiving. There is. But real joy, lasting joy, real happiness is not in self-gratification. It is in giving yourself away, giving yourself to the service of God and to other people. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I was reading a couple of weeks ago, and there was this old uh, Native American um, uh, saying. Um, I thought, man, this is so good. I, I wrote it down. It said, when you were born, you cried, and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way that when you die, the world cries, and you rejoice. I think Paul had that in mind when he was talking about how much better it would be for him to go to a place of no more sorrow and no more tears and no more heartache. Well, we're going to sing this morning as we close this lesson, All to Jesus I Surrender, and certainly that's where we begin. You're not going to get to heaven being a citizen of earth. Yes, you were born and you were created in his image, but the Bible tells us in John 3 that we need to be born again. Where our citizenship is in heaven because that is where, um, the, because of the blood of Jesus, that's where our soul will be one day. And where this tent will be folded up, and wherever we go, wherever we end up in heaven, it is going to be so, so much better. It's not so much the departure as it is the arrival, that I will see the one that gave himself for me, that I will be, I love what First John says, that I will be with him and I will be like him for all eternity. What a great day that will be when we are with him, but we're not there yet. So we need to keep working. We need to keep serving. Real joy, real happiness is found in giving yourself away for a, great, for a great cause. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
Today, this morning, right now, you can become a citizen of heaven, a child of God, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, willing to confess and willing to repent, to turn away from that sin, to give your life to him once and for all, to be baptized into Christ and raised to walk in a, in a, brand, new, in a brand new life that you might live for him. You'll turn away from that sin, but you're turning not away from something, you're turning towards something. Heaven, as we sing, heaven will be worth it all. Listen, one day when you traveled that last mile, all the pain, all the heartache that you've ever endured, it'll all be worth it. Anything, can you imagine, any, any, the, your most wonderful thought of what you have endured, God is gonna even make it better one day when you're in his presence. I look forward to being together with people who have gone on, hugging their neck, if I can do that, you know. If I, 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 I want to spend time with them, I want to talk with them, I want to do all that, yes. But folks, I want to say thank you to the one that made it possible for me to be in his presence for all eternity. Give your life to him. He is the main attraction of heaven, and he is waiting on you to make a decision. I'll be here at the front, an elder will be with me if we can help you in any way you come while we stand and sing the song of encouragement. All to Jesus.